Good afternoon, and we welcome you all on behalf of the Sri Lanka Medical Association for the monthly clinical meeting of January 2024. We apologize for the small delay, um, but we are ready to start off, uh, and we welcome you all who have joined online. Um, so to start off uh, today's monthly clinical meeting, which is on some intricacies of measles, um, before uh, we go on to the speakers uh, and the lectures, I would like to cordially invite the president of the Sri Lanka Medical Association, Dr. Ananda Vijay Vikrama, to speak a few words. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. On behalf of SLMA, uh, I welcome you all for this uh, uh, symposium on uh, measles, which is a uh, very current topic. And uh, this is the first of this uh, for the uh, for 2024. Uh, and I would like to thank the College of Pediatrics and College of Pediatricians for uh, coming forward to do this important topic address this important topic here. As you all know, we are having an outbreak of measles. Uh, this is more of concern because uh, we are we were recognized as a country which has uh, eliminated measles uh, years, four years ago. And unfortunately, now we get to have got this outbreak again and we see patients coming to hospital. So therefore, it is very current uh, to talk on this both the management of these patients and also the prevention of uh, the continuation of this outbreak. Uh, so once again, I thank the, the College of Pediatricians for uh, joining with the SLMA uh, to talk on this important topic. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir. I would now like to invite Dr. Kosala Karunaratna, the president of the Sri Lanka College of Pediatricians, to give us a small greeting. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, I would like to uh, welcome all of you on behalf of Sri Lanka College of Pediatricians for this collaboration with SLMA, the monthly clinical meeting. Uh, why we chose this topic was uh, measles was a disease, as Ananda said, uh, which was uh, eliminated in Sri Lanka. But we saw its ugly head raised to 2023. Uh, some cases were coming to Lady Ridge hospitals. Uh, and we saw as many as around 50 cases. Uh, and we were alarmed and the PIT department and the ministry uh, was very concerned. Uh, the, there were several reasons behind this uh, resurgence, but there were pockets of non-immunized patients uh, due to various maybe religious beliefs and other beliefs uh, that led to this uh, in, uh, increased incidence of measles. So, in fact, so the, the vulnerable group being children under nine months who were not vaccinated were quite a number of children we saw and also adults who were not fully immunized and the immunocompromised were at a very high risk and i won't go into details any clinical details with precision by uh, my uh, senior pediatrician doctor Indisitara, who has seen a lot of measles in his career and, and the development and everything he will go into detail so this is going to be a very important topic for all students as well as all of you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, sir. And now we are ready to go to our first lecture of the day. This is on measles in Sri Lanka, the clinical manifestations and personal experience. The lecture will be conducted by Dr. B.J. C. Pereira, past president of the Sri Lanka Medical Association and founder president of the Sri Lanka College of Pediatricians in 
Uh, thank you very much, uh, Madam Munshah Prasen. Um, I'm very grateful to uh, the uh, Sri Lanka College of Pediatricians as well as Sri Lanka Medical Association for this opportunity to talk to you on measles in Sri Lanka, clinical manifestations and personal experience. <clears throat> Ladies and gentlemen, since of late, we have been talking a lot about measles. However, one can never talk too much about a condition like measles. The reason being that measles is not just a common rash. It's a lot more to it than that. Measles, you might ask the question, now that we have heard that it was certified earlier, that is it a thing of the past? Yes, it was. Because from 2019, was something definitely in the past. Until last year, 2013. Therefore, not now, not quite, not by a long shot. It became a thing of the past due to vaccination. And it is now raising its ugly head due to vaccine hesitancy. Now, to talk about the personal experience in a way, as a medical student in the late 1960s, and a junior and middle grade doctor in the early and mid 1970s, as well as a consultant in the late 1970s and 1980s, I saw loads and loads of measles, also called rubiola and mobili. This is a time before many of you were born, I think. The, it was a disease with very high morbidity and quite a significant mortality rate as well. Now, measles were seen mainly in Africa, Asia, the Middle East, and the few countries in the West. It is now endemic with outbreaks in some Asian and African countries. So globally as well, things have changed. And in developing countries like Africa and Asia, it is due to a lack of vaccines as well as some vaccine hesitancy. However, in the affluent Western developed countries and the rich Middle East, it is purely due to vaccine hesitancy and not due to a lack of the vaccine, because they have plenty of money to buy these vaccines. It is, measles is an airborne, highly contagious viral disease, and it is so contagious that in at least one research report, uh, that if you looked at 10 non-immune contacts, who have come into contact with the patient with measles for just one minute, nine would get it. So that is uh, as infectious as any uh, other disease, and it's certainly much more infectious than almost all of the infectious diseases that are around at the moment. It's a serious problem that can lead to complications and death, um, and uh, it is not to be taken very lightly. And here are some of the complications, keratitis and blindness, especially with those with existent vitamin A deficiency and severe diarrhea leading to dehydration and death, these were not all that uncommon in those days. Ear infections leading to deafness, acute viral encephalitis uh, leading to brain damage and death, and major lower respiratory tract infections and pneumonia leading to death, as well as SSP, that is subacute uh, um, um, encephalitis, slow virus infection of the brain. Uh, where the incidence is one in um, uh, 25,000 cases. Um, it is uh, SSB stands for subacute sclerosing fan and uh, The World Health Organization data uh, has shown that between 2000 and 2020, over a period of about 20 years, vaccination averted an estimated 37.1 million deaths due to measles globally. However, in 2019 alone, measles caused 207,000 deaths in the world. And in 2022, 83% of children in the world received at least one dose of measles vaccine before their first birthday. Now, when you have a vaccine coverage of over 80% in most uh, infective diseases, then one would have a pretty good idea that 
it, it is likely to control the spread of the disease. But this is not so with measles. Because the herd immunity is difficult to establish against measles as the virus is extremely contagious. And you need a very high level of population immunity with two doses in as close to 100% of the population as possible, uh, which is required for significant protection. And of course, if you have a vaccine hesitancy, that would scuttle all this. So you see the problem with measles. Now, there are many measles pockets globally, and it has been from 2019. This slide is actually from 2019. You can see according to the colors uh, that how much of spread there is in measles right across very many different continents. Now, you go on to the clinical features of measles. The incubation period is 10 to 14 days, which is followed by high swinging fever, coryza, cough, and conjunctival fusion with generalized signs of toxicity and feeling ill. That's the start of measles, usually in very many cases. Although in some, it may be quite mild. And uh, in fact, a high swinging fever may not be found in a small minority. The characteristic coplic spots appear by the second or third day. There are white spots on a red base in the buccal mucosa, especially around the upper molar areas. It, is this, it was described by Henry Coplic a New York pediatrician as far back as 1896. Uh, and the classic feature of measles is the erythematous maculopapular and confluent skin rash, which appears by generally by the fourth day. And acute complications may develop from the fifth day onwards. So that's how it progresses. And here is a schematic representation of the various sort of features of measles. Uh, if you can, um, let me get, uh, okay, I have the, the pointer now. I think you can see it, yes. It starts off with a relatively mild fever and then very quickly over about a period of about four to five days, it goes way up into a very high uh, level of fever. And uh, with the onset of the fever, uh, you have the uh, coryza, the conjunctivitis, and the cough, usually occurring within 24 hours of the onset of the disease. And then the coplic spots will appear by about the second or third day, and the rash generally appears almost by definition by the fourth day. So that's how it all progresses. And here are some images of uh, the rash. And you can see that here, even in a dark-skinned individual or a child, that it can be quite noticeable. And these uh, yellow arrows show you the coplic spots in the buccal mucosa. They are diagnostic of measles. If you see it, it can't be due to anything else. The acute complications that could kill are diarrhea leading to dehydration, acute encephalitis, there are several types of it which I will talk about, um, and acute respiratory infections, which were really uh, quite important in those days. And these acute respiratory infections could be due to the measles virus itself, uh, but perhaps even more commonly, it was due to secondary infection. Because measles has a habit of uh, 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 ability to change the immune status of the human body as well. And it's important to know that all degrees of malnutrition increase the incidence, the severity of the complications and the deaths um, in, in measles. Management of measles, there is no antiviral drug that is effective. And what you need to do is standard non-specific treatment Watch out for the complications. So you will look out for the respiratory infections. And this can occur in both the upper and the lower tracts, including acute, acute suppurative otitis media. And that's the thing that leads to deaths in some cases. Then you get brain involvement. And really, there are four types of encephalitis. The first one is primary measles encephalitis in the first week of the illness. 
the incidence is about one in thousand uh, affected uh, measles affected uh, patients, and there is a mortality of about ten to fifteen percent in during the acute phase. Then there is an entity called the post infectious measles encephalitis, which tends to occur during the recovery phase. Uh, and uh, people are not sure even now whether it's due to an autoimmune mechanism or whether it's due to a direct invasion by the virus. But it has again a mortality of about 20%. Then there is a protracted uh, kind of uh, type of encephalitis that you get. It's called the measles inclusion body encephalitis uh, because in pathology, in pathological sections, that you find inclusion bodies in the uh, cells of the brain uh, and it's uh, it's a kind of a subacute measles encephalitis up to it can occur up to about one year after an acute attack of measles and it's more so in those with impaired immunity and when you get it in those the mortality rate is very high it's about 75 percent and the last one is subacute sclerosing pineencephalitis it's SPE which occurs years later Practically decade or so later, uh, chronic it's due to chronic demyelination. Yeah, the occurrence is one in twenty five thousand. But importantly, in infants, it's about one in five thousand five hundred. It's about five times as common when infants get uh, measles than the bigger children or the adult, and it has extremely high mortality. Uh, vitamin A deficiency increases the severity of measles, delays recovery, leads to complications, and increases the deaths. So that's something that was very important long years ago when vitamin A deficiency was quite prevalent even in our country. Subacute sclerosis panencephalitis, if I were to tell you a little bit more because of the importance of the condition, not because of the commonality of it, it's pretty rare, but the importance of it. Uh, it's caused by a measles slow virus infection, the virus staying dormant for long periods of time and then getting reactivated in the brain. As I said, the incidence is about 1 in 25,000 cases. The manifestations uh, are seen around 8 to 11 years. It's very variable, uh, but certainly not before that. Uh, it occurs at that time year, uh, of the, that uh, duration or period after measles, after the, uh, after the disease. Visual symptoms sometimes precede by about two years, and the characteristic uh, eye lesions being focal necrotizing, macular retinitis, retinal hemorrhages, papilledema, and blindness. Finally, uh, there is progressive cognitive decline. The higher functions of the brain go first, uh, and initially, you may have personality or behavior changes, followed by poor school performance and intellectual deterioration. So that's the starting point of SSP. And then there is steady deterioration in motor functions with myoclonus, autonomic dysfunction, and focal paralysis. Some have either focal or generalized seizures, and some of these seizures are sometimes very difficult to control. Uh, and patients eventually deteriorate and fall into a vegetative state or echinotic mutism, which is shortly followed by death. And the mortality rate in SSP is 95%. Nobody knows why 5% survives, but anyway, the mortality rate is that high. And there is no treatment at the present time, no treatment of any sort for SSP. So these are the two important things, uh, ladies and gentlemen, that it, it is a condition, a complication, though rare, which can occur with 95% mortality, and there is no treatment at the present time. An attack of measles per se confers lifelong immunity. Uh, we will talk a little bit about the immunity due to the vaccine a bit later. Uh, measles was endemic in Sri Lanka up to about the late 1980s with heavy outbreaks on and off. And the measles vaccination started in August 1984. Uh, and um, it was the monovalent vaccine which was given at nine months of age. Uh, and uh, we did one uh, research study on this when I was in Ratnapura in, and was presented in 1986, where we looked at the 
the incidence of measles before and after the vaccine, after the vaccine was started. And it was the first study in Sri Lanka that showed that we have the absolutely drastic and very marked reduction, even with the single dose of vaccine, even at that time. However, vaccination was slow to catch on from 1984 to 1990 or so. And as a result, in 1991, the second paper that I have put in there, uh, which I did with another colleague of mine, uh, where the measles was still a cause for childhood morbidity because it, we were not able to eradicate. Uh, and that was again was presented in 1991. And that was from Colombo because I had been transferred to Colombo South uh, uh, General Hospital in Calvoila by that time. So you can see how things have changed, but even then not changed fast enough uh, for us to be complacent about. And then there were major outbreaks with many deaths in 1999 and 2000 for many reasons. And in 2013 as well, the MMR, the measles, mumps, rubella vaccine, uh, which is different to the monovalent vaccine that I talked of before, the, uh, it, it, was, it came into being in 2011, long years after the measles vaccine was started. And the first dose was given at one year because this is what was advocated by the Western countries. They give it at one year. So our uh, schedule was changed from nine months to one year. And unfortunately, they, they, there were major problems if, uh, of uh, infants in their uh, latter part of infancy, uh, around close to sort of nine months and one year, uh, getting measles. Uh, and then we made such a fuss about it uh, that uh, the ministry reverted back to the nine months in 2015. But it took four years for us to uh, convince them uh, to go back to the old regime. Uh, and Sri Lanka, as you heard before, was declared measles free by the World Health Organization in 2019. So after starting the vaccine in um, kind of 1980s, it took sort of such a long time for us to control this disease and uh, ensure elimination of the disease from the country. So that is very important when you look at what is happening now, <clears throat> because there is a resurgence of measles in 2023. If you look at the efficacy of the MMR vaccine, uh, there are many different reports. The Center for Disease Control and Prevention of Atlanta, Georgia, USA, says one dose of MMR vaccine gives 93% effective protection against measles, and two doses of MMR give 97% effective uh, uh, immunity against measles. Now, these are pretty high uh, levels of protection. But then if you look at some of the other bits of um, literature, the Ministry of Health in Ontario, Canada, uh, in a publication has said that the effectiveness of a single dose of measles containing vaccine given at 12 or 15 months, because they have a different schedule, is estimated to be 85% to 95%. Uh, so it can fall between, it can be as low as 85%. Uh, with the second dose, effectiveness is approximately 97%. The same thing that the CDC says. Then Science Direct also has published and said a single dose of measles vaccine provides protection to approximately 80% to 95% of young children in developing countries. So that, that becomes quite relevant to us in, we are in developing countries and certainly very important for the Asian region. Then the National Health Service of the United Kingdom uh, has said there is protection with two doses of the vaccine of MMR for over 20 years. Now they say over 20 years, but what does that mean? Is it polite? Not sure. We are not sure at all about it. Whereas the measles infection itself gives you immunity for life, the vaccine. They say the best they can say is for over 20 years, but because we don't know for exactly how long uh, that would be. 
but certainly does not seem to be polite. Now, these are some, uh, some slides that uh, were very kindly given to me by uh, Dr. Samitha Giringe, the chief epidemiologist, where they have looked at uh, the uh, uh, immunization coverage from 2018 to 2022. And the last two in each uh, column, uh, the greenish ones, are the MMR first dose and the MMR second dose. So you can see the coverage has not really fallen down very much. Um, and uh, even during the pandemic time, that it has not really dropped down all that significantly. It has been around kind of 98, 99% coverage. But look at this. The children with vaccine refusal, district-wise distribution of the 2021 birth cohort. Um, the, the, the top of the pops is Colombo uh, and uh, 627 uh, children uh, and of the, refused the first dose. And then, of course, another 694, perhaps, refused the second dose. So that if you look at some important um, statistics in this, now in Kanpaha, Gaul, Kaluthar and Madhra, you can see the number who have refused uh, the MMR first dose uh, is much lower than the number that has refused the second dose. We don't know the reason for this. And this is something that is worth looking at in these areas. Why this has happened? Because that has a bearing on, on the spread of measles. No. Because even if you have, as I said, uh, given one dose of MMR, uh, and according to most reports, that the best form of protection that you can get is about 80 to 85 percent, especially in developing countries. So that is not going to be sufficient to control a disease as infectious as measles. Now, here is a, a, a epidemiology plot uh, where, now this is where it all started. Yeah right in the um, left-hand corner. Just one single case in May in 2023, last year. And you can see the way it has gone right up to about uh, kind of August, like August, September. But still, you can see even in December. Here, yeah, in December, there are some cases that have been reported. So it has come down, but has not gone off. Now, another important uh, sort of an interesting uh, statistics uh, of the uh, occurrence in certain provinces, the Western, Northern, Central, and Taparakma, which had shown the most number of cases. But you can see the Western again uh, is, is uh, sort of overshadows everything else. Um, and uh, the number is, numbers are pretty high. And here are the percentages. So most of these cases, recurrence has been in Colombo, Gampa, Kalutara, and Chapna. Now, I think this is probably the most important slide of all. Because it has got a bearing on uh, the future and our management. Now, distribution of cases by age of the total number that we saw uh, in um, uh, 2023. Under nine months, 123, counting for something like 17% of all uh, reported cases. Nine months to three years, 93, uh, and that's 30. Now, the important thing about this is that this group, those under three years, is a group of children who has not had the two doses of the vaccine. At best, they have had one. So, now look at this. Distribution of cases by the numbers who have actually had the, uh, the, the vaccine. They looked at that, but what they found was 
that 204 have had a single dose of the measles containing vaccine, MCV refers to the measles containing vaccine. So, which accounted for 28.7%. And unvaccinated, 326. Uh, just a little over 45%. Uh, and vaccination unknown, 143, about 20%. So, inadequate vaccination seems to be uh, the cause. And that is due to vaccine hesitancy. There were no cases in children who have had two doses of the MMR. So, all those children who have been given two doses have been protected. And there were no deaths in children, quite unlike what we saw long years ago when I was uh, quite young. The current meals outbreak in Sri Lanka due almost entirely to vaccine hesitancy. There are some subtle differences. Uh, like quite a number of under one-year-old children and one to three-year-old. Um, variable heights of fever were seen. Rash could come earlier, sometimes rarely on the third day or much later, seven to eight days delay, especially in the immunocompromised. And quite a few got it uh, even after natural measles, mostly adults. Those who have had natural measles, uh, perhaps, I don't know how that occurred, um, or after even one dose of the vaccine. One dose of the vaccine you can expect, but uh, after a natural uh, illness, uh, that it is pretty rare. And uh, acute complications are about the same. And only some have post measles staining, which is supposed to be characteristic of measles rash. And quite a few adults were affected, but none of the affected children have had two doses of the vaccine, as I said before. The vast majority have not had any doses of the vaccine at all. <clears throat> Infants under 12 months are particularly important. It is the age group in whom most of the complications occur. It's not only SSP, but other complications are also much commoner, especially the respiratory complication. And SSP occurs only about in 1 in 5,500, that is five times more prominent than the usual sort of occurrence rate in the other age groups. And quite susceptible due to very low or undetectable antibody levels after six months of age. And this is purely due to another important fact that uh, the kind of antibody transfer across the placenta from the mother that we saw in those days when we were young uh, were due to the mothers having had natural illness and they have had measles as a disease. But now all the mothers who are producing children have got the immunity due to the vaccine. And there is pretty good evidence now, research evidence, that in those that the, the transfer of antibodies is, is not quite as good as when you have the transfer of antibodies following the mothers who have contracted the disease. And there are several studies both abroad as well as one in Sri Lanka, which has shown that in some of those babies at six months of age, the antibodies to measles are undetected. The decision to give the first dose at nine months was based on the presumption of the transfer of maternal antibodies long years ago. Because they thought that if they gave it a little bit earlier, that if the antibodies are there, it will neutralize the vaccine because the vaccine is a live attenuated vaccine. And uh, by nine months would be the time rather than wait for one year like the Western uh, people, Western hemisphere, uh, they will give it a little bit earlier because it tends to fall here. And in some countries, the MMR is given at six months in special cases, especially when the baby is due to travel to areas with a high prevalence of measles. And that country where it's standard uh, procedure and policy is Canada. Uh, I'll show you two unusual cases. Unusual case number one, a uh, gentleman just over six years old male has had a measles infection as a child. So you would expect that person to have lifelong immunity. Then he developed multiple myeloma and was being treated with immunosuppressive drugs. He got measles around the 18th of August last year. He was quite ill, 
with a very severe attack, exertional dyspnea with oxygen desaturation, and uh, the CT scan showed cellular bronchiolitis, uh, which is a pretty severe thing, and recovered well with intensive treatment, but he was quite ill. The second one, uh, second unusual case is the adult dairy dog who has had two doses of vaccine as a child, but we are not sure about it. Got measles around the latter part of August uh, last year, recovered well, quite healthy before and not on any immunosuppressive drug. In fact, that is a child that uh, in fact, I had actually seen um, as a child, that girl, because you can see my writing in there. And in that, now, I had given the measles vaccine at eight and a half months because I think they probably turned up and I didn't want to take the risk of them not coming and I gave it. But then someone else, this is not my writing, this bit, is the MMR prarix has been written, but we are not sure whether it has been given. Then the J vaccine has also been written again, was probably given because they have put one and two and given the dates. Now here, we are not sure. So, the implications are perhaps the inadequate doses of the vaccine should be given, that's not sure. May have had waning of immunity. The last, probably the least likely, is the extramural virus. Now, in, on the 21st of March, 1963, uh, United States uh, licensed the first live music vaccine. And it took such a long time for it to reach Sri Lanka because it was 1963, 73, 83, almost 20 years later, or a little over 20 years, that the monovalent <coughs> uh, live attenuated music vaccine reached Sri Lanka. And then it took another uh, long time that almost sort of 30 years um, for the MMR vaccine to reach Sri Lanka. So that's how long these things take. And now, since 2005, there is a new combined meals, mums, rubella, and varicella, that is chickenpox vaccine, that have been available in the world, but not used in Sri Lanka yet. Now, the MMR Supplementary Immunization Activity of 2024, uh, with, uh, it's called MMR SIA, which started on the 6th of January 2024, a few days ago, where all babies between six to nine months are to be given a supplementary dose of MMR, but they will go on to get the other two doses like normal, later. but of course, with the eight week gap between uh, the, the the supplementary dose and the dose due at nine months. Uh, this is uh, really designed to try and safeguard them and to control the outbreak. It is of vital importance that I think we get hold of all these children in that age group. And that would probably work out that they, those are uh, to quite a large number of these children who are around who are likely to be susceptible to the disease. <coughs> measles, our goal is to make measles just a memory once again. And that's a memory that I would like to forget uh, from my past experience. It is our bounden duty to encourage and facilitate the steps taken by the Ministry of Health and convince the parents to give the extra supplementary dose of MMR to all infants within six to nine months of age. And sadly, unfortunately, even some of the doctors and especially sometimes even the very junior pediatrician have not been very proactive in this, um, in this endeavor. And uh, we have had reports of uh, them even discouraging some mothers being given this vaccine. And I believe that uh, from past experience that this would be almost a crime to do this because I think the implications are quite serious. And if any of those babies, uh, uh, quite a number get uh, the disease, the chances of getting SSP are that much higher and we have no uh, no treatment for SSP and there's a 95% mortality. And it will be one death too many if 
even one dice of HSP. Now here's the here's the uh, virus with so many different proteins around. It's capable of very many different things, and on some random using uh, due to some reading, uh, acute attacks of measles are well known to induce long-term remissions in idiopathic nephrotic syndrome. In fact, when I was working in Badulla, we made it a point to sometimes in resistant cases of uh, nephrotic syndrome to put them together with a measles uh, child. Uh, so we're hoping that the nephrotic syndrome would get the measles. And it did work. It worked. And measles virus vaccine strain infects, uh, which they have managed to do. And measles vaccine itself have shown some effect in very aggressive work in food as a form of treatment. And an extra potent measles vaccine is being tested as a treatment for multiple myeloma. And uh, significant success has been reported by the Mayo Clinic in the United States. So you can see how these things are developing now. And measles is, is uh, such a, um, what shall I call it, such an interesting uh, disease and interesting organism that causes it. Finally, a parting shot, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, I think my birth weight was around 800 grams. In those years, I think hardly anybody survived with that, um, that birth weight. And I also had measles and keplopathy at around nine years of age, where I was unconscious or semi-conscious perhaps, uh, for a total period of over three weeks. So there is every reason to believe that these two would have contributed to a fair amount of uh, brain damage uh, to me over the years. So it's time for me to take my leave, ladies and gentlemen. And as this beautiful young lady would say, thank you so much for your attention. Thank you very much, sir, for that very interesting talk uh, on measles. And we have our next uh, lecture for today. This is on rubella, congenital rubella, and mounds. And this will be presented by Dr. Asanda Randhapaksu, consultant pediatrician based on Sukumaravila, and the web editor of the Sri Lanka College of Pediatricians. Thank you very much for that kind of introduction. And uh, I'm honored and privileged to be here today. And even more honored to be sharing the same podium with Dr. Vijay Sepera. Thank you. So uh, within, within the next 15 minutes or so, I'm going to speak about rubella, congenital rubella, and mouse. First, we'll speak about rubella. Now, rubella is also known as German measles or three-day measles. It is likened to measles because of the rash is very much similar to measles and the rash lasts for about three days. But why did this term German measles come? Now German measles came because initially in the 1800s this was extensively reported in German medical literature. So this is one such uh, occasion where 150 cases were reported in this report in 1887. So that is why it is called German measles. Now what is uh, rubella? It is a mild exanthematous fever in children and adults. In up to 50% of infected people, it's asymptomatic. Even in those uh, who in whom it is symptomatic, it is usually a mild infection. But the major clinical significance is in the congenital rubella syndrome, which we will speak about later. So the rubella virus is an RNA virus. It is transmitted through nasopharyngeal secretions by droplets. The incubation period is roughly around two to three weeks. The viral shedding can occur 
from 10 days before the onset of crash for up to about two weeks after the onset of crash. So if you look at the clinical features of postnatal rubella infection, that is rubella infection which happens afterwards in children or in adults, usually they will have a viral prodrome with fever, malaise, headache, sore throat, red eyes, and lymphadenopathy is another characteristic feature. So they are known to get suboccipital, postauricular, and also anterior cervical lymphadenopathy. And this lymphadenopathy usually lasts for about a week. So the most characteristic feature of rubella infection is the rash. This rash starts on the face and neck. It spreads centrifugally uh, down towards the body and to, towards the limbs. It is an erythematous macular rash. It can become macular papula as well. In the face, it can coalesce, but usually on the body, it's more discreet. Duration is typically three days. It disappears in the same mode it appeared and disappears without this formation. And usually there are no uh, palms and soles involved, but it spares the palms and soles. And by the time the rash reaches the lower limbs, it may have start disappearing from the face. But 20 to 25 to 40 percent of children who get rubella do not have a rash. And then they have some uh, oral features. In the throat, they can develop these uh, tiny rose-colored spots, which are called Porsheimer spots. It is again a German name. And they can have some petechiae, the soft palate. The other notable, uh, sorry, um, the diagnostic uh, features, usually the diagnosis is by clinical diagnosis in our setup. If you want to confirm the diagnosis, we can do serology, we can do rubella IgM antibodies. Rubella is, although the rash looks similar, it's different from measles in that there's no oblique spots in rubella. The, the prodrome is much less severe than in measles. And uh, the, the illness and the rash is of short, shorter duration. The complications of rubella, very few, but you can get post-infectious thrombocytopenia in a few patients. They are they can develop, develop uh, thrombocytopenia, uh, purpura, and some really manifestations up to a few weeks after the infection, but it is self uh, limited. Some of them can get arthritis and some can get encephalitis. So, the encephalitis can occur in two ways it can be a post infectious encephalitis within one week of onset of the rash, but very rarely they can get what is called progressive rubella pan encephalitis, which is very much similar to SSV in measles. Then we'll speak about congenital rubella syndrome. Now, congenital rubella syndrome occurs due to maternal infection of rubella in the first 16, 16 weeks of gestation. The earlier in pregnancy the infection occurs, there's a higher risk of congenital rubella syndrome. So the risk is 90% if the infection occurs within the first 8 weeks of pregnancy. The risk is 24% if it occurs at 15, 16 weeks of pregnancy. Now, the most distinctive feature of congenital rubella syndrome is the chronicity of the virus. The virus persists well beyond delivery. So that means you can actually isolate live virus from the newborn baby with the congenital rubella syndrome. So what are the main feature of, uh, features of congenital rubella syndrome? They get sensory neural deafness. They get cataract, unilateral or bilateral, and they can get this retinopathy, which is called salt and pepper retinopathy. You can see this speckled appearance. They can get uh, the commonest cardiac complication, they get this patent arteriosa, but they can also get pulmonary stenosis, both peripheral, also at the valvular level. They can get low birth weight and psychomotor retardation. So, this picture will show. Uh, all these features, so when they can get meningo encephalitis, microcephaly, mental retardation, hearing loss in about 60% of patients, glaucoma, cataracts in about 43%, pigmentary retinopathy, congenital heart disease, radiolucent bone disease, hepatosplenal megaly and dole disease, purpura thrombocytopenia, and also low birth weight. So, these are this is a spectrum of congenital rubella syndrome. So, how do you diagnose congenital rubella syndrome? 
there should be the presence of at least one of the characteristic clinical features which we, which we described earlier and there should be laboratory evidence of congenital rubella infection. So you can look for IgM antibody in the baby or you can look for IgG antibody. But the IgG antibodies, as you know, can be transferred from mother passively. So how do you know this is due to congenital rubella infection? If the IgG antibodies are higher theater than persisting longer than expected, then we can say it is due to congenital rubella infection. You can also do viral isolation and PCR to confirm the presence of rubella. So management is supportive. There's no cure for this. These children will need multidisciplinary care with long-term follow-up. And also keep in mind that these children, apart from the features that I described earlier, can develop endocrine problems later in life. They can get diabetes and thyroid dysfunction later in life. Therefore, you need to monitor for them when you follow them up. So, from rubella and congenital rubella syndrome, let's move on to the next topic, the last topic, mumps. Now, mumps is an RNA virus. It spreads by respiratory droplets. The incubation period is about two to three weeks. The viral shedding occurs from about seven days before up to seven days after the parenteral shedding. The clinical features include a prodrome lasting one to two days including fever, headache, body aches, and vomiting. And then the characteristic feature is the parotitis, the swelling of the parotid gland, which usually occurs within 48 hours of the above symptom. So initially it is unilateral, but in about 70 to 80% of people, it can become viral. The swelling will peak in about three days, but it settles in over seven days. It can go up to about 10 days. So, in a child affected with pumps or child or adult, there will be swelling of the parotid gland and usually there is obliteration of the angle of the mandible due to the swelling and the ILO will be displayed, displaced upwards and outwards because of that. So less common manifestations include submandibular gland swelling and a mobiliform crash. So diagnosis is almost entirely clinical in our setup. If you do a WBCDC, you can see leukopenia with relative lymphocytosis. And if you do serum MLS, it will be healthy. If you need to confirm the diagnosis, you can do serum IgM antibody, or you can check for IgG antibody in the acute low conversant phases, and you can show an elevation of the T. And uh, to confirm the diagnosis, you can do RT PCR from a buccal low or also serum. So, what are the complications of mumps? Now, in about 10 to 10 to 30 percent of infected people, uh, they can develop meningitis or meningoencephalitis, the typical viral meningitis. Then, some can get epididymokinitis, but this is entirely, almost entirely, it occurs in post-pubertal males who get mumps. So, it's very rare in children. Uh, males who get mumps after puberty, 30 to 40 percent can get epididymokinitis. Uh, but contrary to popular belief, subfertility is quite rare following this. So mumps can also cause other problems like pancreatitis, myocarditis, arthritis, and sensory neural deafness. So there's no specific treatment. Prognosis is nearly always excellent. So I will finish with this last slide. This is the mandible of an elephant. So you might think what this has got to do with mumps. There's a traditional remedy in Sri Lanka where if somebody gets mumps, they would take a piece of elephant mandible, grind it to powder, make a paste and apply it over the mandible. I know of this because when I got mumps as a nine-year-old child, my parents applied it on my uh, parotid area. I don't know why I got better because of that or not. Uh, anyway, thank you very much. Thank you very much, sir. And uh, now we are ready to go to some MCQs. And meanwhile, I wish to remind you that uh, you can type in any questions you have in the chat box, and we will be happy to.
directed to the speakers today and uh, their clarifications or if you have any comments, uh, please share them with us in the chat box. I would like to hand over to PJC sir again uh, to continue with stunting and videos. Thank you. Come on. Uh, we have only just two MCQs because the SLM I requested us to make some MCQs of the presentation. Um, the first one, the following are true of measles. High fever is a mandatory clinical feature. Coplic spots appear after the skin rash. The rash shows centrifugal spread. Measles is infective only after the rash appears. Complications do not occur after recovery. So um, uh, I think, you know, this is sort of hopefully the answers are obvious after what I told you um, before. Uh, high fever is not a mandatory clinical feature because it is seen at a lower degree in some patients and extremely rarely Needles have been presented even without the papillaries. Um, Coplic spots appear after the skin rash, not so. It appears well before. And that is the importance of uh, this because it is of diagnostic significance, especially during epidemics. Um, the ratio of centrifugal spread, that's correct, starts in the face and neck area and then spreads across right down. Uh, the rash shows centrifugal means like a centrifuge, it spreads outwards. Measles is infective only after the rash appears, not so it's very much more infective even in the prodromal stage, that even before the rash appears, uh, it is quite infective. And that is the important part about um, management of epidemics and um, you know, breakthrough infections uh, in measles. Uh, complications do not occur after recovery, but most of the very significant uh, complications, especially the neurological complications, occur well after recovery. So the only correct answer is C, the rash shows centrifugal spread. All the others are not correct. Then the second MCQ, the following are true of measles. Keratitis is a recognized complication in measles. Measles mortality is increased by malnutrition. Hearing loss is a known long-term result of measles. SSP or subacute sclerosing parent hepatitis has a mortality of 70%. And measles complications are less during infancy. Well, I think uh, all of you would probably be quite uh, conversant with uh, the uh, different manifestations of measles now. So the correct ones are keratitis is a well recognized complication in measles, especially in those who are already deficient in vitamin A. And B is measles mortality is increased by malnutrition. That's correct. And hearing loss is a known long term result of measles because when you talk about measles, very few people actually think of hearing. So this is important thing to remember because that is secondary to acute subcutaneous otitis media. And uh, subacute sclerosing panencephalitis has a mortality of increased, has a of much more than that. It's about 95%. And measles complications are less during Not so. All the complications are much more during infancy. So that's the end. Thank you very much.
go to you. Bye. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Peter's sister. We are now ready to take any questions that you may have. Um, there are two questions in the chat. Um, I would like to direct them uh, to our speakers. The first question is, how long does it take the baby to be free from ITTG ITG rubella transferred from mother. How long does it take in the baby to be free from ITG rubella transferred from the mother? And I would like to invite Dr. Sandra to answer this question. Actually, I haven't uh, come across the exact period, exact duration uh, it lasts. What the literature says is now we do clinically suspect uh, congenital rubella as the child is born with the clinical feature. So if at that time you do IgG, so then the theta would be like higher than what is expected if it has been passive transferred from the mother. And also you uh, re repeat it later and then if it is transferred from the mother, it should disappear within like six months of time. But if it persists after that, then you know, quite sure that you are quite sure it is a congenital rubella infection. But how long it lasts, of course, I'm not sure. It, it can last for Yes, maybe because IgG can last for a long time. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, the second question after starting a complex spot, how many days it is infected? After the start of complex spot, how many days it is infected? Uh, this is a question on this. Uh, over to you, please. Let us know. It is quite infective actually even after the onset of the disease and the public spots. It is infective uh, right up to the time or beyond uh, that the rash disappears. So it is quite infective in the post in, uh, post post-exantimeter uh, 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 stage as well. So one would say that even after about up to about even a week after the appearance of public parts, they could still be infected. And this is the other reason why it is so important to, to think of measles as such an infectious disease. I hope that uh, answers your question. And if there are any more questions, we will keep the chat open uh, for a few more minutes. Meanwhile, I would like to open the question Q&A session to anybody in the audience. Do you have any questions you may have raised them? We have another question on the chat. How can you differentiate between mums and recurrent parotiditis of childhood which is non infected How can you differentiate between mums and recurrent parotiditis of childhood non infected Over to you, Dr. Sandal. Uh, of course, mums, once you get mums, it's very unlikely you will get mumps again because it will develop some natural immunity. So if it occurs again and again, uh, I mean, by the name itself, it implies a current parotiditis, but clinical features like, I mean, there will be swelling of the parotid gland uh, and the parent mumps will have the, the, might have the, the complete throat Romeo, you know, the, the fever and the other features. Uh, other than that, of course, I don't think there is any really distinguishing features if you take the parotitis itself. I don't know whether Dr. B.J. Sipela has any other knowledge. No, no, no. Yeah, so I think, yeah, so I mean, if it is recurrent, it's very unlikely to be mouse. Uh, and uh, but the parotitis itself is very much, very much similar. It's very difficult to differentiate. We, we do have seen recurrent parotitis, but the presentation is quite different. Um, and uh, it is usually when you get recurrent parotitis, it, 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 it is generally unilateral because there is very often uh, uh, underlying cause like silactasia. Uh, so uh, in, in, in mums, although it can be unilateral sometimes, uh, that it is usually you get both the parotitis.
we have another question on this hand. So recently developed many antiviral medication, but why is there still no treatment to measles? <laughs> I'm afraid I can't answer that question. Um, people have tried some of the available viral drugs and none of them have really been effective. Um, and uh, of course, uh, as you quite rightly say, that uh, newer antiviral drugs are being produced. So hopefully, uh, within perhaps the, even the next 10 years, uh, that we might come across uh, some compound that would be effective against measles. But I, I suppose by that time, the measles will be eradicated from the world. If they try hard enough. Yes, yeah, from uh, getting the person. Uh, now, the key thing is uh, now when the fever comes, the rash and the fever comes down, and then if you see a rash, it's possible. But as you said now, the person said, then we saw variation. Um, the uh, I think uh, uh, the you know this is something that you see with some of the infectious diseases and the uh, viruses especially uh, things change you can't uh, really sort of uh, consider it to be written in stone like everything um, but what has happened now is that you are probably with the spread of the infection you are getting certain variations of the presentation as a result of some of the mutations that may be minor mutations that may be occurring in the virus. So I think that's the best uh, explanation that I can think of, that why you get this uh, type of uh, change uh, or, or perhaps a quite significant change because that has got implications for diagnosis as well. So I can't give you the exact reason for this, but this is probably due to a change in the, the um, the genotype of the virus itself. We have another question on the chat. Sir, could you explain how acute attacks of measles induce long term remissions of nephropic syndrome? Uh, once again, I think measles is known to produce changes in the immune status. It has got implications for various types of um, uh, conditions uh, where a change in the immune status may be beneficial. Of course, it can be detrimental as well. Um, and uh, we know that there is uh, some neurological component, although we are not quite 100% sure about this in idiopathic nephrotic syndrome. Now, this does not really apply to the secondary nephrotic syndromes, which uh, are caused by very many different uh, diseases to which the presentation of the nephrotic syndrome is secondary. Um, so I think the best explanation we can do is that it changes the immune status. And somehow that has got uh, an effect on the recurrences of nephrotic syndrome. Um, and uh, this has also been confirmed perhaps to a certain extent by the use of immunosuppressive drugs in the treatment of resistant nephrotic syndrome. And in fact, I remember that there are some earlier studies where even uh, Wincristine has been shown to be effective in uh, resistant or recurrent nephrotic syndrome. So I think it's all, all really means that there is a change in the immune profile of the child that will be to the benefit of the child himself or us. Thank you, sir. We will keep the chat open for another few minutes. Meanwhile, if anybody in the audience has any more questions, we are ready to take them. Feel free to share any experiences or any other comments that you have to make on the diseases discussed today. We have one more question in the chat. What's the probable reason for peak at the age of 20 to 30 years? Is it related to vaccine failure? So proceed on measles. Yes, 
Yes, answers. Uh, I don't think once again that there is a very different answer for this. Uh, but we know that artificially induced immunity has a higher uh, propensity to develop waning of, of, uh, of the immunity. And this is classically seen, as I said, in uh, measles, uh, where the natural disease itself causes or leads to, with some very small exceptions, a lifelong immunity. And that can wane off due to several reasons. One thing is changing of the immune status of the person. So that is what happens with you know various types of lymphomas and uh, Parkinson's lymphoma, multiple myeloma, all these kind of things. That uh, thing. But why it tends to wane off uh, from um, the, in a normal person by about uh, you know twenty to thirty years after the vaccine was given? I don't think we know for sure. ಸಿಸ್ಟಿಂಗ್ thank you so much i pray to high heaven that some day they will find a form some form of treatment for ssp because as i said uh, it is a death certificate when you make a diagnosis of ssp uh, and so far absolutely nothing has really been uh, of any use at all even the the convergence that you get later on in the in the advanced stage of the disease are extremely difficult to control and they are very distressing to everybody around thank you so there's another question on ssp Uh, sir, can the MMR vaccine induce SSPD? Not to the best of my knowledge. Um, we haven't actually, I mean, uh, it would account through if it was there. The MMR vaccine ran into a little dispute uh, uh, quite a long while ago due to one paper that was published in the Lancet. by andrew wakefield uh, where he linked this to the onset of um, autism and autism spectrum disorder uh, there and then what happened in england so this is published in england was that all the mothers went was a they went bananas over this paper because it was published and uh, publicized in the newspaper that went all of them uh, stopped giving uh, the measles vaccine and the mmr vaccine to their children and as a result they had major epidemics in the country and later it was shown that this was a completely fraudulent paper and andrew wakefield was found guilty of uh, academic misconduct and his license was withdrawn and <clears throat> he is no more a practicing doctor uh so that's the kind of thing so that was the only thing that was linked to the vaccine but uh, certainly ssp has not been linked to the best of my knowledge thank you sir are there any other questions uh, you can type them in the chat if there are no more questions um, we would like to conclude the first clinical meeting of the sri lanka medical association 
for the year 2024. Um, it was in collaboration with the Sri Lanka College of Pediatricians, and I would like to thank our two speakers, Dr. B.J. Sipera and Dr. Asanga Rajapaksha, for their contribution for today's clinical meeting. Uh, before we conclude, as a note of appreciation, I would like to invite the Secretary of the Sri Lanka Medical Association, Dr. Lahiru Kodiduakku, to please present our letters of acknowledgement to the two speakers. First to Dr. B. J. C. Pera. Secondly, to Dr. Sagaraja Paksha for their contribution. We thank all of you who joined in person and online for the first monthly clinical meeting of the Sri Lanka Medical Association in collaboration with the Sri Lanka College of Pediatricians on some intricacies of measles. Thank you all. Have a pleasant day, and we'll see you next.